Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. And, well, it's a new year. So, time to talk about a new game system. Well, new to me game system. My Nintendo 3DS. Be specific, I, well, got that last year. And I've rented various games for it from Gamefly. I've bought games for it. Um, so, I'll talk about the ones I rented this time. Because the ones I picked up for my own personal ownership or whatever, um, they, they're all pretty much the same. They're, I mean, basically got two Richard Odyssey games, and I got two of the three Shin Megami Tensei franchise games that were released for the 3DS. I picked up Soul Hackers and, uh, Shin Megami Tensei 4, all of which are dungeon crawlers. So, that's probably, they're all similar enough that that's probably merit their own episode on their own. The other two games, other three games I want to talk about are fairly different. Two of them are similar, one is completely different from the other, completely, completely different from the other two. Games are Castlevania, Lords of Shadow, Mirror of Fate, which is one of the games from last E3 that I was interested in, and um, Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate, which is sort of a semi prequel ish to Batman Arkham Origins, um, both of which are kind of Metroidvania-style games, and I also checked out Theatrhythm Final Fantasy. So, I'll talk about Theatrhythm first, because the other two, they kind of neatly mesh together. Theatrhythm is a rhythm-based music game based around the music of the Final Fantasy games, and it covers all 13 games. Theatrhythm came out before 13.2, which I own a copy of, came out. Um, and well, of all the kind of tie-in ideas for the spin-off things for the Final Fantasy franchise I've encountered, this is the one where, when I heard the idea, I immediately went, yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. <clears throat> I mean, I own a copy of Dissidia, and Dissidia is a fun fighting game, but it's certainly not was to think of oh third of uh, tie-in games to Final Fantasy that aren't also RPGs or aren't primarily RPGs. If I was to list kind of ideas, I'd say that fighting game isn't the first thing that comes to mind. Rhythm game certainly would be higher up on the list. So for in for the app rhythm, you have basically you you play three tracks. For Final Fantasy game, well, sort of five, four or five, depending on the, uh, on whether you want to count the optional introductory sections. Um, there is a field stage or field music um, based on the overworld music for the game, or occasionally dungeon music. They have um, a battle music, battle track, which is either a boss fight or just the standard battle music, and then an event scene, which has music from an important scene from the game. For example, um, for Final Fantasy VII, their event music will be Eris' theme. Um, for uh, I mean, battle music, usually it's always generic battle music. Um, and also with this, they usually have some sort of sequence animated with it that reflects the sequence involved, of the piece, piece music involved, for, <clears throat> pardon my throat, for the, oh, for the field music. For the field music, we have, um, footage of your selected character wandering through a world map based on the, um, based on the game, so it's, it's basically not like a small sprite, it's a side view of the character with a backdrop that moves, that reflects the game's world. Um, for Battle Scene, it's the backdrop is based on environments from that game in terms of, for example, you'd have the Tower of um, Mount, Mount Ordeal's background environment for Final Fantasy IV and that sort of thing. Um, and then for the events, we have a sort of animated cutscene thing or film thing showing clips of the game and important narrative sequences of the game. 
if the music in question is a particular character's theme, like Eris's, then the music, well, the, the background footage will reflect that character, or focus on the character. Or, for example, for the love theme from Final Fantasy VIII, the backdrop will reflect the romance between Squall and... Wow, I just well, forgot the name of the main character, of the female lead from... Uh, from Final Fantasy VIII. Anyway. So, we, so, it focuses on the romance scenes for that. Um, in the same sort of vein, um, you have different characters in there with different abilities that you form a party with, because this is a fantasy game. And you level up these characters so they go through various tracks. Um, and they get XP bonuses based on whether they're playing tracks from their game. So, if you have um, Rydia from Final Fantasy um, IV in your party, she will gain more experience for tracks from Final Fantasy IV than you would for um, would the, if you had no character from the game. It was like Cloud and... Um, Lightning and Onion Knight and Light Warrior, as an example. And so you level up, you gain abilities. The abilities that you go uh, give you boosts to help you go through tracks at higher difficulties, whether it lets you heal or lets you deal more damage during the bo- during the fight sequences and that sort of thing. And in addition to playing through the tracks for each game and in sequence and seeing them in the context of the games, there also are sort of unlockable boss fights where you basically go up against bosses from the Final Fantasy games, particularly end bosses like X-Death and Sephiroth and um, all that sort of stuff. And these boss, and boss fight sequences are more difficult, and usually at the highest or near the highest difficulty setting. And you get drops of additional gear which boost your characters and so forth for completing them, and and so forth and so on. And the, there's a whole narrative about this, about the game, or which is kind of similar to the story from Dissidia, where Chaos is planning to unleash primal forces of destruction across the multiverse, and the heroes from the various Final Fantasy games must bond together to stop him, that sort of thing. But anyway, it's that. It plays really well. Um, the game is controlled primarily through the touchscreen. You tap or slide the cursor across the screen, um, the styles across the screen based on the track. Um, certain tracks are done in different ways, whether just tapping, or tapping and holding, or sliding. With um, the field segments, usually it's sliding back and forth. For battle scenes, it's tapping, with usually tapping and holding, and with, and same thing with the event scenes. And the game plays really well. The music, it's excellent. It's the Final Fantasy music. And, I mean, Nubo Uematsu's scores to Final Fantasy games are the best video game music in the history of video game music. Uh, he has a real sense for, not just, for, for more than just small melodies, like with Mario, Mario themes and Koji Kondo's music for Nintendo, but also putting broader compositions, a broader, bigger composition together with different concepts based on character themes and that sort of thing. Um, in an interview with 1UP, Nuopo Umatsu mentioned that he's very heavily influenced by prog rock groups in addition to classical music, particularly groups like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, who were themselves also heavily influenced by classical music. I mean, if you've listened to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer albums, you'll know that they tend to bring in like at least one, like, classical piece of music per album and do a rock interpretation of it. So there's so it, it's really strong music for this type of game, for a rhythm game. And by playing it in this fashion, it uh, you really kind of end up paying more attention to the music because you're you're listening for the cues to tell you when to tap, when to hold, when to slide, because those all of your inputs are connected to well the music and the ebb and flow of the piece, and all that sort of stuff. 
So playing this game kind of probably, if you weren't paying attention to Final Fantasy music before, if you weren't really kind of just listening to Final Fantasy music before, it's just interpreted it as background music, um, I would say that this game, that this, that um, Fiat Rhythm will certainly help to kind of boost your appreciation for it. Additionally, the game has some downloadable content, which is nice, because there's a whole bunch of tracks which didn't make it onto the cart that you can spend a buck or two to download. Priced, you know, appropriately with, say, a track from Rock Band Music Store, or that sort of thing. Um, and lengthwise, they tend to be about the length of most music tracks, two minutes on the low end to up to like five or six minutes or more on the high end. And some of these address oversights in the game's track listing. Although I will say that ones which are specific to like final boss fights, which are a lot of the ones on the downloadable content, um, they do have the minus of you don't, like, if you bought One Winged Angel, say say One, say One Winged Angel was downloadable content, and you bought that and you played that, you would play, like, normal the normal battle sequence, as opposed to you're just fighting Sephiroth. And there is one place that I think this could have missed, is for, like, boss sequences, having the boss fight, and focusing on the boss fight, as opposed to... Um, doing this, oh, fighting a bunch of generic enemies. Boss fight music is meant for a context of a big climactic showdown with a big, dangerous enemy. It'd been nice if they'd done something with that. Similarly, with uh, event music, as an example for Final Fantasy VI, the opera scene, the music from that, which is excellent, is not present in the game. And it's on the downloadable content list either, if nothing to recall. And this is a situation where that music would work really well for a event scene in here, having you see the opera play out in in the game on the background while you're doing the event scene portion. And that would seem to be nice and be worth um, we're worth doing. And there is a second version of the game that is incorporating some of the additional music that was added for the iOS version of Fiat Rhythm, which I hope it gets U.S. release. And hope we get even more music with that, because I would love to play that. The other two games for the uh, 3DS that I rented were Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate and Castlevania Lords of Shadows Mirror Fate, as I mentioned earlier. And these are two games which do different things right and different things wrong. And the things they do right and wrong complement each, each other very well. The point that I'd say... If you could take these two games and lump them together mechanically, you would get what was to take these two fairly mediocre Metroidvania style games and get a really solid title. Mirror of Fate has problems with navigation. I mean, it plays like a good old fashioned Castlevania game. You run to the right, hit enemies with your whip. They have a variation of attack types based on your attack animation is kind of doing, trying to emulate the combat of the console game, which is fun. I enjoyed Castlevania Lords of Shadow. Um, and it has platforming, it has navigating environments, and it has you getting whip upgrades and other item upgrades and keys that let you access areas you couldn't access before and help you get unlockables and um, journal pieces and all that sort of stuff. And the game ha- takes advantage of the touchscreen on the 3DS by letting you annotate your map, which is nice. It's something I like in Metroidvania games. There's one th- nothing more frustrating in a Metroidvania for me than the situation where I have to put a game down for a while, come back to it, and I know where the world is. I can might be able to figure out where where I need to go in this world, and, uh, where I am. But there's nothing frustrates me more than not knowing what I'm missing a while down the road um, to access a certain area, or getting an item and going, oh, I could access this one area now because now I have a longer jump, or what have you. Where was that again? And so being able to annotate the map, say, hey, let me go, oh, hey, I can access this grapple area here now. 
I can access this locked door now. Um, it really sort of augments the exploration in a way that makes it more fun, more interesting, and makes the backtracking feel more organic, or, or some sort of things. I mean, to put it another way, if my character is exploring the castle and drawing a map or have the map with him, if he's got a pen, he can write on the map. Say, oh, I can't get there. I need to have some little grapple. Um, or, oh, I don't have a key for this lock yet. I need the red key or what have you. The cathedral key. Um, so in the same way, I should be able to do the same thing as a player. And props to the developers for incorporating that in this game. The problem is backtracking, the actual act of backtracking is fairly difficult because the levels are very expansive. It's not quite the same contiguous thing that they had in, um, cast in, uh, well, Symphony of the Night, in terms of a big castle, um, and that sort of stuff. There's, there's definite loading screens, including to find indications and marks between areas with big open areas from boss fights and that sort of thing. It's not exactly the same. It feels like the progression from the original Castlevania on the NES or Castlevania 3, where you have the map of the castle and as you make your way through the levels, your line moves across the map and your your uh, dotted line and your uh, quail pin and all that stuff move across the map to indicate where you've gone. Um, now, Castlevania Symphony of the Night lit, had a way where you could fast travel through the castle, through teleport points. You, you reach your warp point, and then you can go to any other warp point you previously discovered. This game doesn't really do anything like that, or doesn't give you anything like that, so if you're going to backtrack, you have to do it manually, which can be kind of frustrating. And also really tedious. So that is something of a bummer. Um, on the other side, with Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate, it plays a lot like a basically a 2D Arkham game. You sneak around, you stealth take down enemies, you have to carefully sort of deal with combat puzzles in certain rooms, and all this, that, and the other thing based on your skill, and based on using stealth tactics and all this other sort of stuff. Um, and the game divides the prison into three different areas, like cell block, administrative, and utility, and armory. So it's four. I'm probably missing another one as well. Yeah, I'm missing another one as well. There's a... Uh, Lighthouse 5. It's going to turn into the Spanish Inquisition sketch. Um, wasn't expecting that, though, but no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. So, divided in these different chunks, and you can fast travel between them once you reach like the entrance area, or an exit area. So, this encourages backtracking and that sort of thing, based on how you've explored the levels, the enemies you've taken out, and new abilities that you've acquired, or new like locked keys or special abilities even locked or delivered to you, all the sorts of stuff you get in a Batman game. Um, and so this so exploration wise, that part works. You can get around the prison fairly easily ish. Because here's where the other problem comes in. Because the game is done three point five D and has some depth in the areas and have you like going up, down or back or whatever but always while maintaining a sort of side-scrolling perspective, it makes the map really hard to read. This game is probably one of the worst maps to read that I've ever encountered in a video game. Um, not since, like, the Doom clones, where you'd have multi-level maps, which only display one map at a time, and it's tricky to view them in context of each other. Um... It's really the kind of thing where if I was, where the best way to view the map would be like it was like some sort of like pseudo 3D construction kind of thing in wireframe. Um, even then, it's got problems. Still, what would make this better actually would be the ability to annotate it, the ability to go okay, look that and go this spot there, this this weird muddle of lines is the elevator shaft room. This spot here is the prison yard. And so just be able to look at the map and tell what different rooms are without having to 
memorize everything or have to take a hand or taking a handful of notes with you at all times, which is not an advisable way for doing this with a handheld game, really would work better for me because and this worked better in general. So, if you took those two things together, if you took Castlevania uh, Mirror Fates map making, and you took Arkham's um, more traversable, more explorable world, and just lump them together, you'd probably get one of the better Metroidvania titles of this console gen- of this handheld generation. No, console console generation is the right word when dealing with portable systems. So, there's my thoughts on those three games. Later on, I'll go talk about the Megami Tensei games I've picked up and the Echinasi games I've picked up and give my thoughts on those, but that's something for a later video. So, if you enjoyed this video and like to know when the next one comes out, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, and you'll get a notification when the next video comes out. Um, so, until next time, thank you for watching. Thank mm-hmm. you.